Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Queer Sports Panel. Woo! Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for showing up. Uh, I wanted to, so we have our great panel today full of wonderful, wonderful artists and writers. Um, and I, now my phone is frozen, so I can't get to the intros. Okay, so I'm going to just do intros for everyone, just so everyone knows who everyone is. Um, so, first we have Ngozi. Uh, Ngozi Okazu is a DC Comics artist, New York Times best-selling graphic novelist, and the creator of comics like Check, Please, Bunt, and the forthcoming graphic novel Flip. Uh, she graduated from Yale University with a degree in computing in the arts, and since 2020, her cartoons have appeared in The New Yorker. Everyone give a, a great round of applause for Ngozi. Um, Next on the line, we have Coco. Uh, Coco Fox is an Indiana-born cartoonist living and doodling in New England. She loves drawing comics about science, magic, and friendship. Her first graphic novel, Let's Go Coco, is out now by Harper Alley. It's a middle grade comic about 11 year old Coco who is trying and failing to make new friends on her basketball team. She's super excited to be here. <laughs> Uh, next, we have Tilly Walden. Uh, is, till, so Tilly is a cartoonist and illustrator from Austin, Texas. She is, cre uh, is the creator of a number of graphic novels, which include the graphic memoir, Spinning, which won an LA Times Book Prize, as well as the Eisner Award-winning webcomic, On a Sunbeam. She currently lives in Vermont and teaches at the Center for Cartoon Studies. Yeah. And last but not least, uh, Jonah Newman is a cartoonist and editor. His debut graphic novel, Out of Left Field, was published by Andrews McMeal this year. As an editor at Graphics Scholastic's graphic novel imprint, Jonah has worked with Dave Pilkey, Jamar Nicholas, and many others. When he's not creating, editing, or reading comics, Jonah enjoys playing in a queer softball league and getting way too invested in his fantasy baseball team. <laughs> <laughs> he lives in Brooklyn with his husband, who is a human, and two kids. <laughs> who are cats? <laughs> They're cats. <laughs> Alrighty, wow, let's hop right into it, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask everyone, uh, why don't you tell us your sport origin story? So you if you participated in a sport or how you became a fan, um, and just in general, why you started making comics about sports. Ooh. Wanna kick it off, Jonah? Yeah, go, Jonah. Sure, okay. Um, I was not into sports at all when I was a kid. Uh, my parents tried to get me into many sports all were, were failures, other than fencing briefly, because it was most similar to lightsaber fighting. <laughs> <laughs> but even that I gave up after, after you know, a couple of years. Um, but then when I was a, a teenager, I started to play baseball, which is a, an experience captured in this book. And there were many reasons I, I got into baseball. In the book, it's, it's kind of simplified to just like, I thought one of the kids on the team was cute, um, which is also semi-true. Um, you know, I was at that age where I was starting to have crushes, on other boys, and a lot of them were baseball players, and they were just so cool, and I was like, I wanna be cool like them, you know? Um, so I started playing, even though I was terrible, just flat out terrible, uh, no athletic ability, no sports experience to speak of. Um, so it was a real struggle for me for a while to um, uh, just get semi-decent at, at this particular sport. Um, but I kept with it, and over time I grew to love baseball, and now I'm, I'm still a baseball fan and play softball uh, to this day. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, my, uh, I've never described it as a queer sports origin story, but I suppose my queer sports uh, origin story is that I was a competitive figure skater and synchronized skater for 12 years. Um, I don't know if any of you have had the experience where you're like, five or six and you're doing something, I remember being five years old and on the ice. And I don't remember there ever being a moment where I was like, I want to be an ice skater. It was just sort of like somehow someone set me down on the ice. I wasn't horrible at it and they were like, well, off she goes. Um, <laughs> and then I did it for 12 years and hated every minute of it. Um, so uh, my most of my sports experiences are negative, um, even though of course there were there were good moments, but um, my, my graphic memoir spinning is about 
uh, realizing you're gay in uh, an extremely sort of hyper-feminine sport. Anyone who did gymnastics or ballet, often we have a lot of common experiences and um, the sort of, the, the way you sort of fall deep into a world of sports, it was my whole life, um, figure skating, and it was so sort of deep in my body. Um, so it's, uh, it's a lot about that, and of course realizing I was gay while also being a figure skater was complicated because there were a lot of like being in locker rooms with other girls, realizing I was attracted to them, realizing I also didn't like my body, and like, but I liked their body, but, and it was, it was confusing, um, and I have a lot of, uh, a lot of pain still about it even today um, and making making the book was very helpful um, so that is my queer origin sports story not not the most positive but um, yeah again like other other people who grew up in these sort of feminine sports um, and also like have a human body and are queer I feel like there's so much that unites those experiences that's that's so challenging um, but that's why I wrote about it oh this is so nice to hear about books I've already read. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Coco, Coco, and I've always played sports, like, all the time. I love games. If anybody wants to play Catan or any kind of game with me, I'm here <laughs> for the next two days. Um, no, but I always played sports. My family always played sports, and none of us were good, which was, like, the fun part. We always got to play. And then when I started to go to school, and there started to be sports you could do after school on a team, uh, my family was like, well, you can't stay home and draw all day. <laughs> <laughs> Joke's on them. Um, so I had to join a sport uh, every like, season that you were allowed to. And so I always played sports, thought nothing of changing in the locker room, thought nothing of any of those things until about sixth grade, and then everything became very, like, Ooh, nobody else is changing in the bathroom stall. Like, oh, okay, nobody else is like worried about why their friend uh, dating somebody else stresses them out in a way that is like not what everyone else is doing. <laughs> so it was really fun to write this book because it's sort of the first time I'm realizing that I like a friend more than a friend in general, let alone like that it's a queer relationship. So it's. Uh, Unrequited Love featuring a basketball team. So, wow. yes. Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? Oh, it's good, can you guys hear me in the back? Good, fantastic. Uh, let's see, I think in like 2004, I was really into the Houston Rockets. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> and I was like shipping Yao Ming <laughs> and Tracy McGrady. <laughs> So, yeah, that's the origin story of Check, Please. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, in more seriousness, I've, I've always truly loved sports. Um, sports were always on when we were growing up. And for me, there's just something like almost like mythical about sports, this idea of like championship and like heroism and people doing amazing things. Are you a fan of Caitlin Clark? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> See, that's how I feel about sports. Uh, <laughs> It's like this, I mean, you're from Indiana and in yeah. basketball. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that for me, just um, learning about sports, there's so much tied, there's so many intersections with sports that I find fascinating. Mm -hmm. And particularly when I was getting into hockey, which happened in college, there was just this very interesting intersection between um, like mass, toxic masculinity in sports, homonormative normativity, if you know that word, in sports, and also whiteness in, in sports. And it was, such a fast, it was such a fascinating intersection that I wanted to just explode, um, which is why I created a character like Biddy to kind of infiltrate that space and like, like kind of learn about it and kind of diffuse it. Um, but in general, I just think that, like a lot of you guys, I don't know how many of you guys actually like sports, or you just here because for the mostly the queer part. <laughs> <laughs> so only one person back was like, I, I, I like sports. <laughs> I watch the Olympics. So people often ask, what's like? I don't like sports. They're boring. What's the point of it? Here's here's the here's the secret to sports. Everything that happens on the court or on the pitch or on the field parallel something in real life. Mm -hmm. That's the most exciting thing. And when you're watching your favorite player play, they are almost bringing this thesis out with them. 
And if they win, that thesis is proven right. If they, what if they don't, it's not. And it's really exciting how sports can reflect politics, can reflect so, like sociology, socio, not socioeconomics even. And that's what really draws me in. So when I was writing Check, Please, I was like, oh, here's a perfect story to discuss uh, gender, sexuality, uh, and race. Um, yeah. yeah, that's why I like sports, mm -hmm. <laughs> for nerdy reasons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's great. That's just uh, very exciting. <laughs> I'm like, uh, so. Uh, I guess my next question is, I know that in both Bunt and Let's Go Coco, there were instances of intergender teams, but usually sport has been a unique environment where people of the same sex come together. And because of that, it becomes a place where the chance for queerness or homophobia is heightened. Um, and so how has that experience or lack of it framed your work? Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think, so could you repeat that last part again? Yeah, so like, because of the like same gender or yeah. like same sex of of sport uh usually how and so it makes it so it's an environment where queerness is more likely to happen or homophobia is more likely to yeah. happen so i guess how is that experience or knowledge of that uh or lack of it in a more inclusive way framed the work that you make so that term that i mentioned homonormativity yeah. is uh kind of a, a word that popped up when I was researching hockey, because you know, like all cool kids research, research the sports that they want to play. Um, and it's this idea that behaviors change when you're around people of the same, who present the same gender mm -hmm. as you. And I think that, and for whatever reason, like I'm so interested in how, um, <laughs> I guess men interact with each other without um, like people who are who identify as women around them, because it just seems to be it like loops around from being like, yeah, dude, we're so straight to just getting gay again. <laughs> um, and I just I always thought that was fascinating when I've always felt like because I've always felt like a tomboy, right? Just like growing up, that was what I like called myself. And it was just interesting how people didn't realize that like their own gender was like changing when around the people, like their own gender expression was changing around the people they were with. Mm -hmm. So yeah, check please is a lot of that. Uh, it's a, and, and it's funny because with Bunt, there's a lot of queer characters, non-binary characters, and gender didn't even matter. They just mm -hmm. needed kids, art school kids to play softball. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody could play. Yeah. I'll add on to the, the, the specifically the, the male like sports world in perspective because a big, big part of my book is, um, you know, my experience as a closeted gay kid entering this, you know, like macho, straight male, cisgender sort of space, which has its own rules and its own social conventions and expectations. And, you know, I, I went to high school in San Francisco when Obama was president. It was like objectively not a very homophobic place. <laughs> And yet, on the baseball team, it was like extremely homophobic and just casually misogynistic and, you know, invasive questions about sex and, oh, what girls do you like? And, you know, making fun of gay people casually and just like all these like little microaggressions essentially that even though they weren't directed at me personally because I was closeted, it made it like very unsafe to come out. Um, and again, it was just like so weird because these guys on the team, if you'd ask them, oh, are you in favor of gay marriage? Do you consider yourself a progressive person? They probably would have said yes. Um, and yet, within the boundaries of that weird social space, mm -hmm. um, it was very regressive. Um, and and um, so, I don't know, I, I tried to kind of capture that in this book a little bit. Um, but at the same time, because it's set in the Bay Area, Jonah, the character, gets to you know explore the Castro and uh, you know has a lot of kind of queerness um, that he has like direct access to, even though he's in this retrograde baseball world at the same time. Um, I totally agree with you, Ngozi. It's like when a bunch of dudes get together, like it gets really weird sometimes. <laughs> you guys not see it? Like, yeah. Come on, bros. Interesting. So I guess on, on the other end, is both of you were in female oriented yeah. sports. So I don't know if that was. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I have my perspective on it is very specific because I was also a synchronized skater, which is basically imagine synchronized swimming, but take them out of the water and put them on ice. Um, it's a sport not many people know about, and it's also it's 
it's interesting being involved in a niche sport because like when people ask like what were you what were you doing this weekend I was like I was in Massachusetts like with a bunch of giant groups of girls in identical outfits doing uh, spins on the ice at exactly the same time um, and they were like what um, synchronized skating is is crazy and it's um, it is these groups of girls and the the gender dynamics are are strange and similar to what you're saying where it just it had its own it was this microcosm it had its own culture it's had its own because also when you spend a lot of time with a group of people when you compete together when you travel together when getting a gold medal relies on all of you working together it at, on the one hand it can become extremely toxic but on the other hand they become like your most intimate the most intimate people in your life, they know you better than anyone. And in synchronized skating, you literally link arms, you're wearing identical outfits, you are trying very hard to look exactly the same. And if one girl falls, it pulls the entire line of girls down. I mean, I would have cuts on my legs because we were constantly doing things where our legs were out and their blades on the end. <laughs> and if you got too close, like, you'd get sliced. But the, I have so many memories of like, hearing another girl's heartbeat like right next to me and like the feeling of wearing some like massive glittery arm but then this like little girl's hand just like gripping my shoulder like holding on to me so tight and there is so much there that is so special and so unique that the intimacy that can come from a team and from like being in a group of girls or being in a group of boys it's it's amazing how sacred it can be at times, yeah. when you are like in those moments during a competition where like you just need each other. Yeah. Um, that is so beautiful. And just to jump off of that, uh, in the experience I'm having in uh, this like sort of true memoir, Let's Go Coco, uh, my best friend moves away and so I don't have as many friends and I join the team to have that camaraderie. And it's weird because there is sort of an energy when you're on a team that practices every day and plays games in you know schools that are 45 minutes away etc how close you get and how much you depend on them i really love that because especially when it comes to queer romances you never know i mean it could not work out but you're still on the team with them and so it's just this sort of strange trapped element that is great when you're like, oh, I finally get to know these people in this context. But then, you know, it's something hard when you're the only queer person on the team and you're having these feelings about other people and they're just completely oblivious. So I definitely love that specific part about telling queer sports stories yeah. is just until the sport's over, you're on the same team. So. Mm, yeah. Um, Another thing I was curious about your opinions on was uh, is what sort of differences are there between writing like a coming of age uh, sp sports story basically as a teen or a preteen compared to uh, either an older sports team like in college or the professional like working towards a professional competition? Hmm. Yeah, because are we, it's middle grade, YA, a YA, a, but college. Y, yeah, it's YA, yeah. but it is college, okay. right? Yeah, but, and then you're kind of, yeah. I don't know. That's de Coco's definitely the youngest, though, yeah, 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 as yeah, far yeah, as, yeah. and I think you've written the oldest. Yeah, yeah. and also, like, <laughs> I feel like, like, NHL, like, professional. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, right, why haven't you guys made your professional yeah, sports yeah. graphic <laughs> novels yet? <Yeah. laughs> your Olympics graphic novels. I know. I, well, I guess I mean, like, also, just in uh, showing, like, queer relationships and like the development of those oh. in your comics at different levels of life, I guess. Like you have the, you know, in Out of Left Field, you have like the coming out high school story. And then mm -hmm. obviously also as well as, as in Spinning, but mm -hmm. Spinning starts at early, like you're 13-ish. Yeah. And then yeah. and then there's very young, you know, like middle school. And then, so I feel like they're all different Maybe eras. it's like a difference of like how many, oh, it varies for everyone, but like in uh, a story, maybe like, when you're younger, you might just be discovering your queerness, mm -hmm. whereas like in Check Please, one of my characters has to have a press conference, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which like obviously, hopefully no one has to do when they're like 13 mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. um, so it's this level of like how, like I guess in professional sports, which is such a strange arena uh, currently for mm -hmm. um, people with different sexualities and different genders, mm -hmm. um, 
there's more of a like, oh, what I do reflects like people. There, are, even though these are fictional characters, like, but it's like, oh, what I do, like, younger people are looking up to me. Yeah. Whereas the stakes might be different, but just as like intense for uh, younger, like, mm -hmm. younger people figuring things mm -hmm. out. Right. And I think yeah. that um, part of what happens in in all sports, probably. I mean, certainly, I can speak to to baseball. Is like the younger people are modeling the behavior of the older people. And Major League Baseball has still never had um, a player come out while playing. There have wow. been people who have come even out. NFL, the NFL has, which is crazy. Yeah, yeah. like. And not even not baseball. Yeah. Not baseball. Wow. Um, you know, there have been players who have come out after retirement. There's been minor leaguers who have come out, but never an, a major leaguer while actively playing. And I think that speaks to the continued, very you know, repressive homophobic culture in these clubhouses. And even just a few weeks ago, there was like a player on the Red Sox who got caught on a, you know, the, the, the mic picking up the action on the field, caught him like calling someone in the, in the crowd a, a gay slur, you know, and he was suspended for two games, like slap on the wrist, you know? So the whole culture is still like that. And so, you know, boys who are starting to play baseball often are watching the major leagues and they're, they're looking at that behavior and the, to the toxic masculinity just kind of filters down. Um, so even if it is, I would say, easier in, at the lower levels or in certain communities, and so much of this stuff is so complicated too because of gender and where do you live in the country, and, and there's all sorts of factors, but it may be easier when you're younger. Hopefully it's easier now when kids are younger than it was even when I was growing up. Um, but I, I think like, the, we need things to change at the top level before we yeah. start to see broader change at you know, the amateur and, and college and anything below that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Women's sports is totally different though. Totally yeah. different. Yeah. 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 Uh, like the WNBA, which anybody following the W this year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like they have a, like, a, like on the LA Sparks, there's a um, athlete who identifies as non-binary, has had top surgery, it's not like an issue, and just, I mean, and the Connecticut Suns, there's two players who are married. <laughs> so uh, it's just like, it's, it's kind of different, I guess, with professional women's sports. Um, right. Yeah, anyway. But I wonder if, and I, this is something I think that is in Coco's book for sure, is even when they're like, there is change, and like looking at the WNBA, I still feel like for like a little kid, realizing their queerness, even when there's acceptance around them, I think the, like, the pain and the struggle mm. of realizing who you are is maybe like in any generation and in any context, like kind of hard. Yeah. Do you th I mean, you can speak to it more because that's so much of in your book. It was so important to me that exactly what you just said of like someone showing that just knowing that you aren't going to be straight sucks. Like it just, mm. and, it, and there's, a really nice character who's in it. There's only one out character, and um, and it's really nice to have the base of like there are people who are out, but I always thought that I wouldn't have to worry about this. And it was like having the chance to do a book that is at the middle grade level allowed it to not really have any action as far as like mm -hmm. uh, acting on all those feelings and stuff, because I sort of wanted it to be about that internal time of figuring out that you're queer. And I've been wondering this about Bunt as well. Uh, on my team in this, it's a no-cut policy. You're, I mean, on that, they're asking everyone to join the team. Yeah. I wonder if there's some looseness of not accidentally knocking everyone down. Mm -hmm and not uh, being worried about everyone in your class judging you in the same way. I've, I've been wondering if there's something to the amateur -y sports yeah. to be a little like gay like something, or yeah. Yeah. Anybody something special. Can, yeah. yeah. Anybody can join. Anybody mm -hmm. can join. Anyone can be part. Yeah. I feel yeah. like I, I experienced that as an adult because as as a mom now, um, I find myself constantly looking at email listservs like, what are people doing around town? <laughs> I'm going to go take a class in some, like, like, Adult education is great. Um, and I find myself participating in these very low key, very random sports because there's no pressure. Like I, I do speed skating with a bunch of children. They're all so much faster than me. Uh, but one of them I was faster, faster than, I was faster than him by the end and he was really upset. I was like, oh, I can't believe it, that annoying grown up. But, so, but I've realized that like when 
<laughs> when you're older and you can participate in sports casually, yeah. it's so illuminating. It's so wonderful to realize you like you can like join a softball team, you can like play kickball, you can do this stuff. Um, and I find it too doing sports as an adult with a body that is done growing. Yeah. Great. Love that. Love not going through too many changes. Obviously, pregnancy was a big one, but I was out there doing, getting really slowly, yeah. and everything was fine. But I don't know. That's the adult yeah. angle. That's, yeah, like like I play in a in a yeah. queer softball league now. How it is, is it? So fun. Yeah. To be like it is so fun. Um, yeah, just to be able to play without toxic masculinity really being in the picture. There's plenty of drama. Of course. There's plenty I was about of to like, say, Jonah, yeah. Yeah. so much drama. Um, I was telling Agosi about some of this like recently, just like the the conniving and the the plotting <laughs> to like maximize your chances at these tournaments. And anyway, it gets intense. Are but there at least, rivalries? Oh yeah, oh, big time, oh, big yes. time. Oh my god, like I've almost seen like like fist fights appear almost, but it's not. <gasps> But it's not because like people are being homophobic. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's that at least. Um, but I think it's really fun and it's just been such a joy to be able to keep playing the sport that I grew to love um, without dealing with the pressure and the, the sense of not fitting in that I had in high school. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm really just loving this this panel. Um, uh, <laughs> um, something that I I feel like I, I can't remember. Sorry. I've like I'm just really listening to all of you say things, but then it like leaves my brain. Um, something I was very interested in was thoughts on like I feel like there's always been this understanding or this idea that certain sports are like more gay than other sports. Oh, yeah. Like and and like you were saying like the the women's basketball teams and like even even I don't know just anything like women's rugby for oh, example yeah. like and so I guess just yes. thoughts on like what makes sports gayer than yeah. others? And and then some sports are like no, like at all. Like like you were saying, baseball has no out right. players. So I just was interested in thoughts on that. <laughs> Oof, I have a lot of theories, but well, start That's with the first nice. one. Uh, okay, so it's like this. <laughs> I keep using the word intersection, but I think it has to do with a lot of uh, what goes on outside of a sport. Um, so like, I think it's so weird because like the MLB has like so. I won't just talk about professional sports. Basically, I think it's a lot of like the cultures that create the sports mm -hmm. and then how much interaction that sport has with like multiple genders. I don't know. How yeah, to no, that. you're onto something there. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know what you guys think about that. I think, I think it maybe has to do sometimes too with how sports present. Yeah, gender, mm -hmm. because like it's would be surprising, or it's surprising for people to think of like a ballerina as a lesbian. But it's it's easier when in like a lot of the male figure skaters that I'm friends with are gay, and they like sort of dressing up, and they like um, that there is sort of a more feminine aspect to it. And I think like people have accepted gay male figure skaters faster, much faster than they would a gay male baseball player, because yeah. of like how. Mm -hmm. It's presents like how you express the sport, but I don't know. It's a really, it's a good question. What's, What's the answer? Okay. <laughs> I, was, What's the answer? I was wondering, Tanya, in uh, Count the Light, your book yep, that just count, came out. Yes. Now, what sport does that center around? It's pro wrestling. And pro I think of that yeah. as the ultimate. Like, <laughs> it seems so gay. Yes. <laughs> well, well, but uh, but it's there is something where yeah. they don't want you to think it's gay, well, even it's, though it's so obviously gay. That's, a, that's <laughs> the interesting thing, though. So so it's the that idea of who the audience is and what you're projecting. So yes. I feel like, for example, with pro wrestling, it's very, for a long time, was very hyper-masculine yes. and hyper-feminine. So all the men were, were, you know, six foot five, huge. All the women were in underwear and mm -hmm. not really wrestling at all, right? So, um, and the, uh, the crowd was mostly male. So it was the male gaze on, or the straight male gaze on this, this performance art but then now I feel like there's so many queer wrestling fans out there and like I feel like that has changed the way that the sport then is perceived because the audience has changed so I, I guess that could also be the same thing for other sports yeah yeah that the audience the makeup of the audience impacts yeah the sport itself maybe it's like the symbiotic relationship right yeah because also again then also as time goes by 
uh, the people sometimes who are engaging in the sport, like maybe as young people, then go into the sport and change it. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> right, and also I, media must play a role too yeah. when I think about like sports manga and how yeah. certain sports have gotten crazy popular because of certain mangas. Yeah. I also yeah. think like team size plays into it in a oh, way. Yes. If you're like a solo, like like I'd be, I wouldn't be surprised if like a there was like openly more openly queer tennis players versus like mm. on like a right. huge football team or something. But it's like I guess. Do you feel like what about uh, like players engaging with each other and I then how that, that's yeah. in, mm -hmm. that's viewed by both I guess internally and externally. Like I always think of. I don't know why my brain went this way, but I think of One Direction. Um. Go on. Yeah, say more. Who had that um, on their please. bingo card? <laughs> like, I always think of One Direction. <laughs> well, like people like shipping the members of One Direction directly impacted their relationships. Yeah. And I know that that's happened all over. It's not that's just awesome. One Direction, uh, but that's what, where my brain just went. That's why Tracy McGrady and Yao Ming stopped playing together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's me. He knew. Yeah. <laughs> no one was shipping that. <laughs> that was a weirdo. Um, and now I'm trying, now I'm like, okay, what's the, how do I go yeah, from there? Like, what do we, that? yes. <laughs> um, I guess something I was interested in was, so three of you, uh, Tilly, Jonah, and Coco, did autobiographical comics about mm -hmm. your, in, you know, queerness and sportsness. Um, and then Ngozi did uh, a comic about, uh, a sport you haven't played. And so, um, <laughs> as a fan, well, I just think it's great because I also, as have, a fraud. <laughs> having made a comic as a fan of pro wrestling, I just, I'm wondering maybe thoughts on the differences between doing uh, auto, like an autobio comic um, as opposed to like more of a fan or like fan view comic. And then also, if you're interested in doing more sports comics that are not related to your own experience in sports. So to be clear, I did two comics mm -hmm. about Sorry. sports yes. I do not play. <laughs> <laughs> but you played art school. I played mm -hmm. art school, yes. the hardest sport of all mm -hmm. time. Yep. Mm -hmm. And and you nailed it with both of them, honestly. Like yeah, the like, softball thing <laughs> yeah. and some of the softball drama. It's it's you know it, it hits. Thanks. It hits. <laughs> yeah. I did your research. I did my yeah. research. But I, would you guys ever make a story about a sport that you didn't play? God. You, you, nah, y'all wouldn't. Come on. No. <laughs> I, I played so many sports. Oh, I cool. want. I just right. want to. You have variation going. For yeah. You. Uh, yeah. I definitely. That was my favorite part, except the weird thing is when you have played a sport your whole life and you just know the rules. I remember at one point my wonderful, wonderful editor was like, you have to kind of explain how to win <laughs> and like how you play that you can't run around with the ball. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll put that in. And that became really fun Okay. to like something I already care about feeling like I'm teaching it. So mm -hmm. even if you hate sports, you could still like it. I feel that way about, I have never played hockey, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm thinking so much about hockey. <laughs> hockey is also having a moment. It's so like, it is. in stories. In like romance novels. Yeah. But like, mm -hmm. it's like a, you know. Does it, does it bother you? Ripper. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. I'm glad. You're it's, here for it. It's, it's interesting. What was that one that was the ice skater with the hockey player? It's like famous. I can't. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. You sounded confident, so I think that's right. The perfect yeah. title. Yeah. Jonah, would you like would you write like a fictional baseball Yeah, a hundred percent. I like mean, it on another sport? Yeah, I well I actually don't care about any other sports, you guys. Oh. Okay. It's only baseball. Oh, sorry. Baseball I had to like pretend leaders. that I cared about football for a little bit because I was working for this sports website, but like all my knowledge of the NFL is from twenty seventeen, so <laughs> As, as far as I know, Eli Manning is still the quarterback of the Giants. <laughs> um, nothing has changed. Whoa. But um, but I really I love how in 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 all of our books and um, another book that comes to mind for me is is Dragon Hoops um, by Jin oh, Yang. I love it. It's an excellent excellent sports graphic novel, and I think um, the trick is to like have it appeal to sports fans, but also to non-sports fans. You want to make sure, like you said, Coco, like it's accessible to people who know nothing about the sport. It has to be clear what the stakes are and what's going on emotionally and why this matters to the characters. But at the same time, you want to have the sports action be cool and authentic. And 
I remember like um, getting a, a review of this book that commented on like Jonah's hand placement on the bat. And, like it was like wrong before he learns how to hit and then like to yeah. fix it, you know? And that's such a small detail that I included that I figured nobody would notice, but somebody noticed because like this particular reader like knew a lot about baseball. And so um, I was glad to include details like that that would make baseball fans happy, um, but also took great, great care to make sure that even if you know nothing about baseball and you don't care about it at all, hopefully the story will, will resonate for you because you know, at its heart, it's really about coming of age and learning to be who you are and, and sort of letting go of external pressure and, um, and, and letting go of like expectations from people who probably, whose opinion probably you shouldn't care about. Mm. Your book also has like a lot of humor in it too. Yes. I don't know, is that just how you write? Just like. <laughs> I love humor, laughing is fun. <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't love to laugh? Yeah, and, and it's so easy to laugh at myself in this book because I was so, so bad at baseball and <laughs> just like falling on my butt and just, yeah. Um, so um, I don't know, I, I think that is part of just my voice as a creator. Mm -hmm. And it's part of, it, it, it's a big part of a lot of the cultural content I enjoy as well. Um, but for this particular story, it also felt like a fit because even though there are, you know, there's homophobia and there's some upsetting things that happen and, and some heavy emotions, but it's also like, it's high school and I don't know, kind of looking back and realizing that the things that felt very important at the time ultimately weren't that important and that makes it easier to kind of laugh at yourself and and take a light tone that, I don't know, maybe if teenagers read this, they will take themselves a little bit less seriously and that'll make things easier for them. I feel like the thing that excites me, I don't think I'm ever gonna make another uh, actual sports graphic novel, but I really want to do stuff with made up sports mm. because there's something about like a flat field and a boring yes. uniform that I'm like, I'm not drawing that 500 times because I'm gonna have to. Um, and I like, I like the idea of taking what is so like crucial and important in sports stories, which is like the heart and the dynamics and the pressure, and applying that to like something I actually want to draw, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which I like sort of vaguely did in On a Sunbeam. I like casually made up a sport that involves fish and orbs, but I didn't try very hard. Um, I think I, if I tried harder, I could do a better job of like making up. I, I like fantasy sports. That's a Sam Bosman book, isn't it? Yeah, um, <laughs> great book. Uh, I'm excited for it. Like that. That excites me. Yeah. Great. Um, I think we're going to go to questions soon, but I have one last question um, that I just thought of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is um, uh, thoughts on <laughs> on High School Musical <laughs> and the difference, but like the, the parallel of sport with something artistic, like they were doing musicals, but all of you are artists. 10 out of 10. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. And I'm a big fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I mainly thought of it because I was thinking of the I don't dance scene in High School Musical 2 and baseball. You, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, yeah. Just the thoughts. You've never seen High School Musical oh, It's all right, Ngozi, there's a showing right after this oh, on my phone <laughs> next to me. I can't wait to watch. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, well, so we want to wrap up about like five minutes before the hour, um, and it's like, to 240-ish. I don't know if anyone has any questions. I don't have anything left. Oh, also, we should probably, uh, everyone, I want you to promote your stuff. Okay. Should we do that now or should we do that after questions? We should do that now. We should do now? Yeah. 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 Okay. Like yeah, I'll start. Actually, there's something I wanted to say oh, previously yeah. that I didn't get a chance to work in, which is, Tilly, your uh, graphic novel, Spinning, was a huge inspiration to Outlook. Oh, thank you, John. You're so welcome. Yeah. <laughs> um, which it started as a memoir and then I kind of was like, eh, I'm going to fictionalize some things and I kind of Good pushed idea. it more in that direction. <laughs> but yeah, like that, you know, queer coming of age story was, was, was big for me. So just wanted to let you know. Thank Aww. you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Self-promotion time. <laughs> yeah. Sell those books. Pivot. Uh, so I'm at table W29A. Um, I have copies of Out of Left Field, plenty of them. So help me get rid of them. And I also have some older zines and some stickers and pins and fun merch like that. So uh, yeah, come on by. And I'm working on a, another graphic novel now, also with Andrews McNeil that is a ways away, but I'm just starting to write it. And um, it's also why and it also is about kids sort of figuring out who they are and learning to make authentic choices um, in the context of college admissions madness. Mm. So that's going to be fun. Oh my god. Oh my god, you guys, it is so that fun. Got a big reaction. <laughs> 
It is so fun to write entitled parents. Like, oh my God. Like the dialogue is, whew. It's, just, it's a blast, yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's good. Um, I am at the table W87 with my wife, Emma Hunsinger, and I have a lot of books for sale. Spinning, Ice Skating, Gay, On a Sunbeam, Space, Gay. Are You Listening? Trauma, Sad. Um, junior High, I did it with Tegan and Sarah. Um, oh, what else is there? Oh, I love this part. I don't know. There's a lot of books there. Um, what? I don't know. Are you listening? Yeah, I don't know. There's there's a ton of books there <laughs> for all your queer sad needs. Um, and then I have prints and stickers and various things. I will also shout out that uh, my wife, Emma Hunsinger, her book, How It All Ends, um, which just came out, is at our table. Emma is also on a panel tomorrow, the Back to School panel. Um, and who knows? You should go to that, too. Um, and what else am I promoting? Oh, I will be signing at the Avery Hill table. I don't know what the number is. I think it's a J somewhere um, at 5 p.m. tonight and then I have a signing tomorrow at I don't know I don't know what time it's on my Instagram <laughs> but uh, come on by and I'll sign your book um, you should definitely check out Emma's book as well it just came out like what a month ago yeah same week same close to Coco <laughs> we're uh, siblings in the book world um, I am promoting Let's Go Coco because it's my first graphic novel ever Ooh. so I'm very excited welcome you did it and my mom is in it um, oh. yeah so all, like my whole family is like hidden in the book so you get to you know do that but uh, yeah I have them all at my table W34A and I am tabling with Annabelle Driussi and we're doing a workshop tomorrow so if you want to draw comics I think we have a few spots left in. It's at noon in a room that I can't remember off the top of my head. But um, you can come by my table. I have it written somewhere. W34A, tons of like cute little things. This is probably a bit, probably the most emotional thing on my table. But everything else is very cute. And I have a little vending machine thing. Ooh. If you sign up for my uh, email list, you get like a surprise. Ooh. So come on by. That's it. What's up, guys? Okay, so I'm in Guzzi again. And let's see. I had two books come out this year. Okay. Crazy. So I had, yeah, well, one of them I uh, only wrote, but I, um, my friend Madeline Rupert illustrated. Madeline is at table D4. Table D4. <laughs> you have to go to table D4. You guys are going to go? Everyone's going to go? Yes. And say, <laughs> don't... Just say you, you just saw her stuff and you liked it. Don't tell her. <laughs> She'll just be like, oh my God, everyone liked my stuff. <laughs> um, so, but you can actually, I think like right after this, I'll probably go to table W87 if you're 86. Same. No, we're the same table. Yeah, it's 86, they're, 87. They're touching. They're, our they're, they're, they're kissing. <laughs> <laughs> they're kissing. Um, so if you go there... After this, I'll be signing books. I have Check, Please, which is a queer hockey romance. It's the story of a former figure skater who loves to bake but is afraid of getting checked. And then I have uh, Bunt, which is the story of art students who have to win one game of softball in order to get athletic scholarships. Bunt is so good. You've got to read Bunt. It's, Bunt is so good. I think it's a really fun story. And then, again, that was illustrated by Mad Rupert at table D4. Oh yeah, there you go. I like this call and response. And then I also have a book that should not be at Small Press Expo. Don't say that. It's DC Comics. It's the opposite of Small Press. I love it. Uh, if you guys love Jack Kirby, um, I have a book out called Barda, and it's a story of a soldier girl on a dystopian planet who has to torture her crush. So oh. I know. It's juicy. It's juicy. So you guys can get all of that at table. That. W86. Okay. Um, also, I, I didn't introduce myself. I just want to say hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Tanya, Tanya Dorf Mankey. And the reason I'm the moderator of this is because I am writing a queer pro wrestling graphic novel, Yay. of which the first chapter is at my table, which is C17A. So if you're interested in enemies to lovers, uh, dudes pinning each other and throwing each other around, Come to my table. <laughs> it's called Count the Light, right? Yeah, Count the Lights, count the light. yes. Because when you're laying on the mat, you're counting the lights. So, uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> <dang>. Yes. 
Um, but yes, so we have a little bit of time for questions. If anyone has any questions, uh, I know there's two mics. I think. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. Go right ahead. Um, <laughs> ah. I apologize, lots of thoughts. Uh, first off, real quick, if you're still interested in uh, fencing because it's lightsaber fighting, there's apparently a company that just, it's, it's called like Ludo Play. One of my friends lives up in Boston and it's literally lightsaber fencing. They even like have a full on lightsaber. They even have national championships or something that he wow. like went to, so. Very intriguing. <laughs> um, Secondly, um, the National Postal Museum, if you're staying in D.C. for a little bit longer, actually has an exhibit on baseball. It's right across from Union oh. Station. I think it's mostly done through postage stamps and whatnot, but it's still, it's, still, it's still very interesting. They have, like, fan letters, Sally Ride sent to baseball players, and then there's also, like, you know, talking about... There's, like... Uh, it's very bilingual as well, so a whole lot of Spanish, but there's also, like, things talking about how, like... The guy who wrote the original history of baseball was trying to be like, no, it was totally only white people that invented it. No, no New World influences at all, mm -hmm. right? Um, but anyway, I do, I do, uh, the, the actual question I'm kind of trying to form to ask is uh, kind of building off what um, Miss uh, Dorothy Mankey uh, mentioned, and I'm very glad she brought up the whole, uh, the high school musical and like, you know, the intersection of sports and arts, um, because they're like, I mean, right up here, right? We have some sports that actually overlap a whole bunch with arts, right? Because like ice dancing is an Olympic sport and yet ballet isn't, but also aren't they very distinctly similar? <laughs> Don't you kind of need, you know, similar body types and whatnot? Um, and so I just, uh, I guess I am kind of looking for like any additional thoughts y'all have on that of sports as, you know, because both sports and arts are these distinctly human things that only emerge because we have excess and can create culture and whatnot. And they are like these strangely enough spaces for self-expression and uh, on top of everything else, you know, even though like some of them have very intense rules and everything. Um, but yeah, no, no. Yeah, so. I can jump in on that question because yeah. um, I often think about that intersection about, between sports and arts, uh, and I think that maybe the closest I would because I do think sports, like in athletes, they can be beautiful and can do beautiful things. But I think for me, sports is really close to craft. Like I feel like that same part of the brain that is used to repetition and perfection that happens with craft. Um, like I think of like, I don't know, like Steph Curry shot or, um, I mean, I don't know, I just think of, that's the closest thing. <laughs> I think of like something that is yeah. done over and over and over again and looks beautiful. There's a method to it. There's a certain variation mm -hmm. where I think art can be more like experimental. It's usually a form of expression. So if maybe on that spectrum of human expression, it'd be like athletics, then crafts, then art. Yeah. Mm. I definitely think there's a Venn diagram of uh, performance in sports yeah. because yeah. you kind of need to have the same chops. And so I, I feel like that like Tori Bolton thing is super mm. common mm -hmm. because that's the person on mm. the team who can not sweat it while they're performing and while they're playing games. Um, but I definitely, I love, I love that kind of story. Can, mm -hmm. can somebody on this panel make another one? Yeah. It's a musical, <laughs> please. <laughs> I think I obviously yeah there's so much there's so much intersection. I do think that gymnastics and ice skating both have a very interesting mix of art in sports because we do it to music or certain certain forms of gymnastics do it to music and it is always like just sort of a fascinating little window into like the soul of the person who is doing it even though I know from experience that sometimes your coach picks your music for, music for you and you're like oh my god why am I skating to this um, but I love I love when sports have opportunities like that like for what the person is wearing for what they're moving to to like express a little more about who they are I think there, yeah, I totally agree. A lot of, lot of similarities. The thing that comes to mind for me is just like the physical practice involved, like especially with something like comics or any form of visual art, there is so much repetition and training your muscle memory to be able to do that. And that is, you know, what you have to do in sports. There's also a lot of luck involved. Uh, for example, mm. getting a book deal, a lot of luck involved, mm. you know, a lot of luck in, in sports. It's sort of like in both sports and art, you put in good work over like sometimes a very long period of time and you work really, really hard. And then like 
Maybe you'll get the outcome that you want, maybe you won't. Um, it's not always fully within your control. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. So we're going go to gonna go this side. Oh, are we going to go to this Ooh. side? I don't know. Oh, cool. <laughs> can, you, can you speak up? Uh, I, I can hear you. Yeah, they can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a high school teacher up in Baltimore. I teach English, and I have a little reading corner for kids when they're done with their work. Uh, the school I teach at has like a really big sports presence, so obviously this is very interesting for that. Uh, if I had a book for one or all of you, yeah. oh. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. this little reading corner, and I had a kid pick it up and ask me like, "What's this?" What would, uh, what would look like a good short answer be? <laughs> for our books or yeah. for another book? Yeah, yeah. I'll go with uh, a graphic novel about being gay on the baseball team. <laughs> Simple, straightforward, accurate. Yeah. I mean, there's one answer, which is that it's about being queer and ice skating, but I think what it, on a deeper level, what it's about is being really good at something that you don't like doing. Mm -hmm. And how do, you, how do you learn to leave leave that? Um, I'd say mine is about uh, finding who you are through friendship in sports. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I think mine is also kind of about finding who you are mm -hmm. through friendship in sports. Not to plagiarize your answer. That's okay. <laughs> we can share it. Yeah, but it's about like, um, like yeah. Like, uh, actually, I would say on a deeper level, yeah, it's also about a queer character realizing that he does not have to change at all to mm. have strength in who he is. Mm. Yes. I think yeah. that's, that's a common thread for all of our yeah. books yeah. is yeah. self-identity and, and, yeah, becoming who you are um, with the help of or perhaps with sports being an obstacle to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, Thank you. Hi. Thanks. Yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. No awesome robot voice. Oh, well. <laughs> Maybe next time. Um, so my husband teaches circus flying trapeze and trampoline and a lot of what he does as a coach is try to undo and heal trauma inflicted by other coaches and I was so um, my mind just lit up when you guys were talking about where it's safe to be queer what cultures create a safeness and it, it struck me that it's not just safe to be queer it's safe to exist in any way um, and the kind of violence that is implicit in these cultures. And none of you spoke about the culpability of adults. Um, you spoke about this lateral culture, which I think is very true to the child experience, that adults feel irrelevant even when they have so much power. But I wonder if there's anything that your books can do to just get adults to do it right. Um, and also capitalism, because I think the difference, <laughs> just to throw that capitalism. in there, <laughs> the difference between like men's baseball and women's basketball has a lot to do with capitalism and what people know how to sell. It's less to do with the audience and more with what you know how to sell. And I think everyone is watching women's sports. Actually, I'll fight back on that. I think, like, especially women's sports, it's a black queer league. It has entirely to do with the people who are playing and the audience. It's queer That's right, women but watching. because no one cares about your audience, no one's inflicting this capitalist rule that you have to be not friendly to queers. Anyway, we're just talking now, and I'm not asking yeah, you questions. No, but kind of I would love to hear your thoughts about like, <laughs> what your books can do for adults to help you know, with a change of culture, not just showing kids that they aren't alone. I'll, I'll also jump in if I could say that, like, I think, this, I know for myself, I'm, like, my books are for young people who are looking for a lifeline. I think a lot of adults might jump in and be like, oh, I wish I had this as a kid mm -hmm. or something. But I think the nature of, like, young adult graphic novels, for me, is the, is the target the people who might need it the most mm -hmm. at that moment. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I just wanted to mention the two coaches that I depict in this book. Um, one of them is the PE teacher, and he is awful, <laughs> like horrific. Um, so, you know, hopefully an adult will read that and be like, hmm, <laughs> is that me? Have I ever used a homophobic slur before? Um, and then the other coach is like sort of, he's, he's kind and he's well-meaning, but he also has sort of blind spots and has like traditionalism to him. Like, you know, for example, he, he totally ignores and does not support the female player on the team, but is willing to support um, the Jonah character and help him get better. And so there's the, like that gender divide there, even though both of these players are outsiders on the team in a sense. Um, so I, I, don't, I guess I don't have a great answer other than just like, 
showing models and mm. maybe that causes people to think more about their own behavior. Um, I mean, it would be great to have a graphic, like graphic novel representation of a really lovely coach and someone that other coaches can aspire to. But at least, you know, in my particular case, like I didn't have that. I had, you know, adults who were at best flawed and at worst, like really bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't. I don't think books can do it. I think um, there are fantastic. Um, organizations that have come about in the last 10 years that specifically investigate um, sports safety concerns for kids. Um, one of those organizations investigated and prosecuted one of my coaches, and it was amazing to see like change actually happen. Um, it was amazing to be able to like give a statement. And I think that it does come from oversight, and it comes from people being aggressive and following up when a lot of kids are talking about having complicated experiences. And I think it also change comes from when we acknowledge that like there are a lot of really horrific people in sports but then there are a lot of coaches that are like always towing the line between what is okay and what's not okay mm -hmm. and it can be really really hard for kids to express that like this coach is fine for me like most of the time and every now and then they say something that's really challenging and navigating that and just like looking for that behavior because it's up to adults to figure it out and help kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, hopping on the like, is it almost okay? Is yeah. it, um, I had some parts in my book that I've had parents reach out to me about more so than coaches, but I think adult, I, I think you can kind of relate any adult in the story as something an adult could learn from. But um, there's a lot of anxiety that you have internally and maybe the people around you don't see. And you see it, you can do it really easily in a comic. And it shows like this moment where the main character, me, is um, going through a really difficult day, but the adults around them don't see it. And then they get really triggered by the fact that, you know, a person's upset. And I felt like a lot of the coaches and adults uh, just assume that the kids are going to be fine once they get there. And I, I'm, very, I'm very into the idea of coaches being a lot more warm. They, yeah. they should always be warm. I, there are enough hard people in the world. Like, uh, I, yeah, I would love to see more depictions of sweet, sweet coaches. My coach in this is kind of nice, but uh, you'll see that he has one little mess up that leads to the whole plot of the book. Um, I don't know. Do we have time for one more, or are we done? One more. One more. Okay. Go, go, go for it. Oh, oh. he can My, just shout it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's a challenging question and it's one that every artist has to investigate for themselves because there actually is no answer that works for all of us. For me, um, what I did is I just didn't think about the fact that the book was going to be published and I just poured my soul on the page. Um, and I was like, future Tilly is going to deal with the consequences of this. <laughs> Guess what? She did. It's fine. Um, I, but that level of vulnerability doesn't work for everyone. And it's complicated because also sometimes a lot of people read your book and also sometimes no one reads your book. And that's, there's also loaded feelings to putting your vulnerability in a story that not many people see. Um, but yeah, you have to investigate the line for yourself, I think. I'm curious what you both, you both think and Ngozi for the fiction side. Yeah, I mean, I think there really is nothing too dark for any type of story, even though you know, people might think of young adult as a bit lighter. Teenagers and young people go through trauma every single day. Mm -hmm. And I think when someone sees it on the page and says like, oh my gosh, I didn't know other, like someone, even this fictional character is going through this, there's a tremendous amount of like sympathy and empathy that can happen if it's happened to you or you've seen it happen to others. Um, I think it's always important to like, <laughs> There's this great Toni Morrison quote where she was talking about, not to answer for uh, like writing about yourself, about being careful about putting too much of yourself into the story. You have to put what's good for the character into the story. And oftentimes that's like a 
that's like an editor pointing out like, hey, like I see your rage, I see your trauma, but this has served the story. So it takes a little bit of like mm. uh, self-honesty, but also a little bit of narrative precision to get that. And that just takes practice. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah, it never really occurred to me to not be honest about like the sort of things that happened in high school. I mean, there's like implied sex and language and drinking and like things that kids actually go through. And um, my book was recently challenged in Kansas. Um, mm. it, we don't have time for the whole long story, but like I spoke with someone in that community and he was sort of asking me about, he was on my side, but he was sort of asking me about some of these choices that I made. And what I kept coming back to was like, this actually happens in high school. And if anyone who's challenging this book can honestly say, no, I never went to a party. I never said a swear word. I never like fooled around with another kid. Like, you know, it, it's just not realistic. So I just wanted to be real about that because I think teenagers have a very like finely tuned BS filter. And if they sense that something is inauthentic, that's gonna turn them off right away. So I wanted to make sure that they could connect to and, and relate with my book. I love this question because uh, I've always wanted to know what you all think of it. Uh, but then also uh, being honest in, I did a few drafts of this book before it came out. And um, I noticed the first one, I knew it was a memoir. So I had a really hard time showing when anyone else messed up. It was really easy to show when I messed up. But it was, it was really hard to think like, okay, it's 100% true. Memoir has to be as close to the sentence I said. Mm -hmm. It's not true. <laughs> um, you don't have to do that. But I, I really wanted it to be as true as possible. But then when talking about serving the story, it was easier for to me to make the side characters of my sixth grade basketball team uh, semi-fictional. So I like changed what everyone looks to like and um, sort of like mixed people around because I felt a little like I could be more honest by making it a tiny bit fictional mm. yeah. versus like nice. sacrificing any of the emotion and how hard it got. I mean, there's some physical violence in it and it was just important that I could still show what happened without feeling like I had exposed someone who was 11. You yeah. know, I, it, there's, there's a whole range of that, uh, mm -hmm. but for me, that was, that was it. Okay. Okay, we have, we have, we're definitely done with our time. So I just want to thank everyone for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you to our wonderful panelists. Make sure to go to their tables, buy their books, read their things. Thank you so much for coming. Thank Thanks, you everyone. Guys. Have a good con.